Chapter 29 Masahiro meant to be a good boy. While he ate his breakfast and studied with his tutor, he was serious and obedient. He was careful not to pout while father's soldiers stood around guarding him as if he were a prisoner in jail. He wanted to convince father and mother that he'd learned his lesson, and they would surely ask his tutor and his guards whether he'd behaved himself. But now as his tutor pointed out mistakes in his arithmetics test, he just finished, Masahiro itched with frustration. How he hated being cooped up inside the house. He wished Toda hadn't caught him yesterday. He wished that when he'd spied on Yangesawa and the ladies, he'd learned something so important that father and mother would have forgiven him. If only he could help them instead of staying home and doing nothing. The arithmetic lesson ended. His teacher departed. Masahiro fidgeted while he waited for his reading tutor. The soldier on guard duty this morning was a young samurai named Hayashi, who looked as bored and restless as Masahiro was. How about if we play outside for a little while, Hayashi suggested. I won't tell your parents. Alright, Masahiro said. He had to escape before he could stop them. He couldn't take them back, could he? Because he didn't want to disappoint Hayashi. That was Masahiro told himself as he followed Hayashi out the door. The sky was grey, and the day warm and humid. Masahiro ran across the garden enjoying the squishy wetness of the grass that soaked his socks through the sandals. He batted at the low foliage in the trees and laughed as water droplets showed onto him. The teenage garden boy stood on a ladder propped against the wall. He'd removed his short blue kimono and his floppy straw hat, which lay on a rock near the ladder. Clad only in loincloth, he pruned the pine seeds. Hayashi threw a ball to Masahiro. They played catch. Two young, pretty maids came out of the house, batted their eyes at Hayashi and giggled. Hayashi dropped the ball and went over to talk to them. Masahiro was left alone. He watched the garden boy climb down the ladder and go off on some errand, leaving the ladder in his discarded clothes. Masahiro's heartbeat quickened. He moved towards the ladder. Wouldn't it be fun to climb up so high? First, Masahiro picked up the clothes and wadded them under his arm. He didn't stop to think why. He mounted the ladder. The punch and sharp needle through the pine trees concealed him from anyone below. When he reached the top, Wrong up the ladder, he couldn't see over the wall because it's too short. He set the garden boy's clothes on the wall, while he grabbed the top of the wall in both hands and scrambled his way up. He heard Hayashi chatting with the maids. His feet bumped the ladder which fell away from him and hit the ground with a soft thud. Horror filled Masahiro as he crouched atop the narrow wall and wondered how he was going to get back down. Masahiro, where are you? Hayashi called. Startled, Masahiro lost his balance, he tried to steady himself but his scrambling hands found the garden boy's clothes instead of the wall's solid face. His fingers slipped. He toppled off the wall and landed on his back in a pile of sand on the other side. The hat and kimono plopped onto his face. Masahiro lay, the breath knocked out of him, stunned. He cautiously wiggled his body, although the fall had jarred every bone in him. The sand had cushioned his landing and nothing seemed broken. He flung the clothes over his face, looked up at the wall and the overhanging pine boughs. He heard Hayashi on the other side saying, Where did he go? Chamberlain Sano will kill me. Dread flooded Masahiro. When father hears about this, he'll kill me too. Father would never believe that he hadn't meant to climb over the wall, that he'd fallen off by accident. Masahiro scrambled to his feet. He was in a passage that divided the mansion's grounds from the rest of the estate. The path between two stone walls had been dug up. The passage was empty, except for the sand pile a stack of new paving stones, and a wheelbarrow. Luckily for Masahiro, the workers had taken a break, and they, didn't, they had caught him. But he would be punished no matter what he did next. Father and mother would never let him outside again until he was grown up. And then, Masahiro saw a bright spot amid his troubles. Now that he'd escaped, he had another chance to be a detective. What did he have to lose? He snatched up the garden boy's clothes, which he hadn't meant to steal, but would certainly come in handy and he ran down the passage before Hayashi could figure out what had happened and come after him. Masahiro would make the most of his freedom. This time he would discover something so good that father and mother would be glad he'd broken the rules, and he wouldn't feel guilty about his disobedience. Masahiro didn't let himself think that he must have meant to escape all along. Accompanied by his two top retainers, he rather glanced over his shoulder as they rode through Kurame. They had stopped in front of the shogun's storehouses near the so made a river. He thought he felt the now familiar presence, but he wasn't sure. He lay in awake for most of the night, his senses straining to detect the slightest hint of his unknown foe. 
Several times he'd sat up in bed, his heart pounding. Nothing happened, except that Midori had grown tired of being awake and she flounced off to sleep in another room, telling Hirata that he was imagining things. Maybe he had been. Maybe he still was. Kurame was known for its many shops and particularly for toys. Hirata and his men steered their horses around pedestrians and streets devoted to dolls, kites, fireworks and Takashiya-san, cheap sweet shops that sold candy and inexpensive trinkets. Wandering peddlers hawk kokeshi dolls and blowfish whistles. Hirata didn't think of buying presents to surprise his children, as he might have another time. His mind manufactured threads when none exi existed. Every casual glance from a stranger, every movement or flare of emotion within the crowd wound his nerves tighter. He knew that he was exactly what his enemy wanted. The mind was the warrior's most formidable weapon. When it was strong and steady, it could win battles against opponents with better combat skills. An expert martial artist could influence the mind of his opponent by instilling such fear that the opponent became weak, helpless and easily defeated. Hirata had often used this strategy, but now he was its target. He felt his confidence draining away, his spirit weakening. Although he usually liked to travel alone, today he had brought Detective Inui and Arai. Their company didn't bring him a sense of security, however. Indeed, his wish for protection made him feel more vulnerable. He and the detective turned onto Edo Street, the main road that led to the northern highway. On the right, between the road and the river, stood the shogun's rice warehouses. On the left side of the road were tea houses operated by Fudasashi. Merchants would deliver the rice to the shogun's retainers for a commission, then bought the excess and sold it at a profit. They also loaned money, another business that made them hugely wealthy. Hirata dismounted outside the biggest tea house, which bore the name Gita, carved on discreet wooden placard by the door. Inside, male voices shouted numbers. Hirata and his men entered a room where a rice auction was in progress. Arms raised, waving frantically towards the die at the back of the room. Merchant called out bids. Hirata watched the man at the center of the die. Ogita paced, shouted and gestured like an actor in a kabuki theater. He wasn't more than average height, but he stood tall. His brown kimono surcoat and trousers were made of cotton, in accordance with the sumptuary laws that reserved silk for the samurai class. But his garments had the sheen of the highest quality fabric. His bald head and long fleshy face shone too. With grease from a rich diet, his eyes were narrow slits that squinted with intelligence and didn't miss a thing as they darted back and forth spotting bitters. He wasn't fat, but he had a bulging double chin. It seems to amplify his voice as he repeated bits and demanded a better price. His energy aura was bigger and stronger than anyone else's. He dominated the crowd. But as he studied Edo's top rice burger, he rather made a troubling discovery. He was usually good at reading people, but his sleepless nights and his state of distraction brought the concentration he needed to assess Okita. His fear had begun to affect his work. How was he going to handle this interrogation? The auction ended. Losing bidders left to try their luck at other houses. Okita and the winners closed the deals by applying signature seals to contracts written up by the spot by his clerks. Servants poured ritual cups of sake. When the customers left, he rather signals his detective to wait by the door while he approached Okita. He introduced himself then said, I'd like a word with you. The state of Okita's eyes opened wide in surprise. What about? I'm investigating a series of crimes. I need your assistance. If Okita was alarmed, he rather couldn't tell. Now I'm at your service. Okita spread his hand in a gesture of a man who had much to give and nothing to withhold. Then you'll be happy to answer a few questions. Bereft of the extra sense that usually aided him during interrogations, he rather fell back on standard detective procedure. He asked Okita his whereabouts on the days that Chion, Fumiko and Nan had been missing. He expected Okita to claim he couldn't remember details from so long ago. But Okita called a clerk. Uh, bring me my calendar. The clerk fetched a cloth bound book and handed it to Gita. Gita paged to the date Hirata had mentioned and reeled off a list of activities that included rice auctions at his tias, business meetings around the city, banquets, his son's wedding, and drinking parties with customers, friends, and government officials. He smiled and asked, Is that good enough? That only accounts for four for your days, Hirata said. What about your nights? I was at home with my family and my bodyguards, Gita added. A man in my position has plenty of enemies, and I'm a target for thieves. My bodyguards bodyguard stay near me wherever I am. Rod didn't doubt that they would confirm his alibi. 
may ask why you're so interested in my business. Gitta spoke with mild curiosity, without the caution of a man who was guilty of crimes that threatened by the law. He rather despaired because he couldn't discern whether Gitta's manner was an act or not. Used to relying on the powers gained from strenuous training and magic rituals, he felt as if he'd regressed to his days as a mere ordinary human. Three women were kidnapped, held prisoner and raped during those periods, he rather said. And you think I'm responsible? Okita's expression said he thought the idea was so absurd that he couldn't bother to be offended by it. I'm certainly not. You haven't asked who the women are, he rather pointed out. He wasn't so distracted that he hadn't noticed the omission. Maybe that's because you already know? Okita glanced at the ceiling long enough to convey scorn. No, I don't know, but I suppose I should find out who's been slandering me. Who are they? Was Okita pretending ignorance? He rather only wished he knew that. One is the gangster Jiroto's daughter. The second is a nun named Tengo In. The third is Lady Chio, wife of Captain Okubo and cousin of Chamberlain Sano. The rice broker's greasy face showed no recognition, except for a frown at Sano's name. Well, my condolences to them, but I never laid a hand on them. I don't even know them. You should be familiar with Lady Chio, he rather said. Her father is Major Komasawa. He's in charge of guarding the warehouses that hold your rice well. I know him, not his daughter. Rada couldn't have said whether he was lying or telling the truth. She grew up in the Kumasawa clan's house, which isn't far from here. You must have seen her. Seen her, maybe. Anything else? No. Okita made a negative Adam and slashing gesture with his hand. An orange crept into his expression. If I want a woman, I don't have to kidnap or rape one. Here, yeah, let me show you something. Okita stalked to the die and spread out the rice contracts that lay upon the table. He dabbed his ink-stained finger at the huge sums written on the contracts. With what I earned today, I could buy ten women for each day of the year to do whatever I want. I can't really think that I would stoop to kidnapping anybody, especially a relative of a man important to my business. Rod couldn't deny that Ogeta had a point. But a man could become sexually obsessed with a particular woman who was beyond his reach, and none other would satisfy there's a witness to the effect that you did. Oh, who? Anger tied Nogita's double chin. You rather explained about Jinjichi, Gumbai, and the proprietor of the drum tea house. Never heard of them, Nogita said. But I'm not surprised that they've said bad things about me. People like to shoot arrows at the highest devils in, on the tree. Rada gazed at the contracts, disturbed because he had hoped to bring Sano more than he expected denials from the suspect, to make up for the fact that the men had lost the ox cart drivers. It's more money than you'll see in your lifetime, Okita said, crassly. He's taking Hirata's somber expression for envy. He lowered his voice. I'm going to offer you a deal. You leave me out of your investigation, and I'll make you make it worth your while. Hirata stared in disbelief. Are you trying to bribe me? Let's just call it a little private business arrangement, Okita smiled. Nobody had offered Hirata a bribe since his police days. His long-time reputation for incorrup incorruptibility and Sanos were well known. Forget it, Hirata said. You can't stop me from investigating you by paying me off. Suit yourself, Ugita's smile persisted, but turned as menacing as a mouth calf in armor of face guard. If you don't like that deal, then how about this one? Three of Chamberlain Sanos' biggest allies owe me a lot of money. If you cause me any trouble, I'll call in their debts. I'll be ruined financially. Now make sure they know who you are to blame. Think about where they'll leave Chamberlain and Sano. The allies would surely withdraw their support from Sano. They would also try to influence the Shogun to throw him out of the regime and overlook for another leader. Who would that be but Yanikisawa? If three major allies defected from Sano, the balance of power would tip in Yanikisawa's favor, which could give Yanikisawa the impetus to resume his campaign to destroy Sano. He rather faced a serious dilemma. Well, Okita said. In his mind, he rather heard Sano's voice. I won't give in to blackmail. If I lose my allies and Yanikisawa makes his move, so be it. I'll take the risk for the sake of justice. He rather admired Sano for his principles. But his own principles were different in this case. As Sano's chief retainer, he rather was duty bound to protect Sano, even if it meant going against his wishes. He couldn't allow Okita to make good on his threat. As he evacuated, another thought confused the issue. 
Maybe Okita wasn't responsible for the kidnapping or rapes. If so, Hirata would have put his master in jeopardy for nothing. Hirata never knew what he would have said. Just then, the menacing pulse of energy vibrated through the air, striking him dumb. His whole body snapped to a sudden fearful attention as his nerves began to ominous tingling and his blood raced. He forgot Okita, his enemy was close at hand. Ears pricked and nostrils flared to cast the man's scent. Hirata silently vowed that this time he would find his enemy. This time they would fight and he would win. The pulse emanated from the tea house back room. Throwing his sword, Hirata advanced towards the curtain doorway. What are you doing? Okita said puzzles. Detective Arai said, Hirata son? Ignoring them, Hirata yanked the curtain aside. Beyond the doorway was a spacious room for parties. Two maids were rolling fresh tatami mats onto the floor. The pulse drew Hirata to another doorway. Ugada and the detectives followed. Is something wrong? Detective Inoue said. Hirata shushed him with a gesture of his hand. He peeked through the second curtain and saw a large dim storeroom. Sake barrels were stored in rows. Three servants unloaded more barrels from a handcart. Hirata slowly put one foot after another into the room. Screeches and howls resounded from another dimension that impinged in his mind. A bright flare of energy erupted from behind a row of barrels. Hirata lunged around them towards the energy. The servant yelled in fright, running for cover. Okita cried, Have you gone mad? Hirata slashed his sword at the place where he thought his enemy was holding. But there was no one. His sword cut through a sake barrel. Pungent liquor spilled. Sensing the princess behind him, Hirata whirled and charged and slashed. His blade carved more barrels. The space between the rows was vacant. Don't just stand there, Okita said to a detective. Stop him before he wrecks my place. The detective grabbed Hirata, but he threw them off. He kept attacking empty air. He didn't know whether he imagined feeling the energy or his foe had projected it towards him, a trick that only the most expert martial artists could manage. Now the presence seemed to move us outside the tea house. He rather rushed through the back door into the yard, where fireproof storehouses with iron roofs stood. The daylight on the whitewashed walls struck his eyes. Blinded and reckless, he followed the pulsating energy down a path between the storehouses. At the end of the path, cornered by a bamboo fence, stood a dark figure holding a sword. Anticipation and the thirst for blood raged within Hirata. He rushed forward and swung his sword with all his strength. His blade cut flesh and bone. A scream of agony pierced his ears, drowned out by the noise in his mind. The pulsation stopped. The blindness and rage cleared from his vision. Triumphant and panting, Hirata sheathed his sword and looked down at the man he'd killed. Crumbled on the earth lay a peasant boy, no more than thirteen years old. His body was cut clean through across the middle. Viscera and blood pooled around him on a broom he dropped. His baby's face was frozen in an expression of terror. Okita and the detective ran up on Hirata. They all stared at the carnage. Okita exclaimed, You killed my servant! It hadn't been his enemy he'd cornered, Hirata realized too late. It had been an innocent bystander. The sword Hirata had thought he'd seen was only the broom the boy had been holding. No, Hirata cried. He knelt by the boy patting his cheeks and rubbed his hand in a frantic effort to revive him. But it's no use. Not even a mystic martial art expert could bring the dead boy back to life. He rather felt the pulse of his foe's energy fading into the distance like a taunt. You won't get away with this, Gita said loud and with fury. Even if you're the Shogun's investigator, you'll pay. The detective pulled Hirata to his feet away from the dead boy. You know, he said, come on, hirata son, we'd better go. As they led him out of the yard, he rather realized that his trouble had just gone from bad to much worse. That was exactly what his enemy had intended. Chapter 30 Across the 